Hello, everyone. Welcome to Wider Angle. Um, I'm so happy to be joined by Elisa Bassist today. Welcome, Elisa. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I thought that one useful way of leading this conversation would be through addressing several themes from the book. So how about we start with misogyny in the medical system, both factual and revealed through the descriptions of your personal experiences. Just to give a small heads up, and I mean, you visited 20 doctors between 2016 and 2018, and we learned that you each week average two to three appointments, hoping to get explanation on undiagnosed chronic pain. When so much was going on with your body, why was the answer so often, nothing is wrong with you? Or even worse, could it be that you don't want to get better? What did you discover about both yourself and gender gaps uh, and medical treatment of women and their health in general? So first of all, it just blew my mind that these doctors playing God who know everything had no idea what was wrong with me. And, but instead of saying that, they just said, nothing is wrong with you. Not, I have no idea that I have no idea what it is. While they were acknowledging that something was happening, they just invalidated that anything could be wrong because the test didn't show anything, scans didn't show anything, blood work wasn't showing anything. Um, and I wondered why my body was so weird until I started reading more medical memoirs that women have written and they were coming up against the same experiences. And it actually has a long history of why we are treated this way. And it begins in ancient Greek. Um, and it also goes to present day where most medical trials are done on the average white man. Most drug trials are done on the average white man. We see the average white man as the human body, the universal body, and everything else is abnormal or atypical and a lot of autoimmune disorders and undiagnosed symptoms, medically unexplained symptoms, most of these primarily affect women. But because we don't treat a woman's body like the human body, and we don't test medication or um, even teach menopause in medical school, I found some study that 80% of medical students feel uncomfortable treating or even discussing menopause. Mm -hmm. So because of all of this, what's happening with research and our long held beliefs about not believing women, not listening to women, not feeling that a, wo that a woman's body is a human body, that a woman's suffering is human suffering, we aren't equipped to treat women. And my body wasn't a mystery. It's just that we see women's bodies as mysteries we because we don't study them and because we have all these biases against them. Yeah, I mean, you cite one study as well that approximately 70% of patients with medically unexplained symptoms are women. I and mean, that's, that's huge. And one part of that is, of course, labels, right? I do want to uh, show those who will be watching this conversation, this fabulous cover as well of um, Elisa's book. And the title is very simple, but it's fantastic, hysterical. Tell me about how you, how you chose it, why you chose it. it it's based on one of your earlier essays, right? Um, actually, so my book had so many different titles and I had an earlier essay called On Silence, and it was about being silenced. And one of my earlier titles was Shut Up. And it was going to be about how women are silenced and live in silence. But it ended up being about so much more than that. Like that was just one facet of what, of the problem I was experiencing and what I was coming up against. And then one day during a nap, I thought of hysterical because Shut Up just wasn't quite right. It didn't capture the the many facets mm -hmm. of what women endure in our lives in terms of silencing like we're not just told to shut up we tell ourselves to shut up we are told that we are crazy for experiencing normal human emotion 
We are name called constantly for being sick, for having pain, for saying an opinion, for expressing a feeling. No matter what, we can catch a label and it all derives from the original label of you're being hysterical and you have hysteria, which has always been seen as a disease that only women can have because it comes from the womb. Yeah, that's that that was a really fascinating part. And I was curious and wanted to ask you precisely that because I got to admit that the nerd in me also really enjoyed how you blended the personal element with a lot of research and precisely just what you said. I mean, from Greeks to Egyptians all the way to today, can we talk a little bit about the actual history beyond behind this term that is so often, like you say, just used to dismiss women um, in so many situations? Yeah. So when I started writing this book, I was writing just about myself, um, but nobody wanted to buy a book about me. You know, we don't really care that much about women's experiences I even felt that I internalized that I was like, nobody's going to care what I have to say. So I felt like, and I was told that I have to back up my experience with research, evidence, other people's accounts, experts, authorities. I'm not an expert or an authority. So that's why I included so many voices. And as I was researching, I was like, the personal is political. Everything I'm experiencing is what we are all experiencing and um, it has such a history and it is embedded in our DNA and it is just in the water supply. It's something we feel every day, but really can't see. Um, So as I was looking into the history of hysteria, I feel like a lot of us think like we have a handle on it, like Freud invented it. Um, No, it's actually been around since like the beginning of medicine um, with Hippocrates and it has carried through in like every single century and has like a new meaning in every different century that in some way dismisses or demonizes women and their pain and suffering and their thoughts and feelings and whether they should vote or not. I mean, it's just like, it's the most wide ranging diagnosis. You can be called hysterical or have hysteria for any thing. And you can be inherently diseased because you're a woman. Um, uh, So that was sad. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I was just shocked. I felt like my jaw was just like permanently dropped (laughs) while reading more and more and more um, of how like we are controlled by our wombs. We are trapped in our bodies and it's always men who are diagnosing this and they are in charge of the narrative So many books on trauma are written by men. So much trauma is perpetuated by men. I mean, it's just so Mm -hmm. all-encompassing. And it's because it's endured through the ages, we go to a doctor now and that doctor may not be in any way overtly sexist or misogynistic or believe in Freud, but we've we have these values and these ideas in our genes. Mm -hmm. So what people were believing in the, in like in ancient Greece, they were believing that um, the uterus was the origin of all disease. Then like in medieval times, women who were hysterical were possessed by the devil. 19th century, women were incarcerated. They were certifiable. They were treated by men who said, at first they called it a physical disease. Then they were like, it's a physical disease caused by repressed sexual trauma. And I can help you exercise your trauma by by narrating it and like they started um interpreting our internal lives for us uh, then uh, uh, yeah even and- in the DSM, like the mm-hmm. the mental health bible hysteria was in it until the 1980s 
I was just about to say that literally it was insane to think because you, one thing is about all these perpetuated things that like you say, are now ingrained in our psyche, but also still on paper, 1980, that's not that far long ago. I mean, and, and like you describe in the book, it's both, a, it was considered medical condition, mental condition, emotional condition, spiritual condition, whatever you want, want you know, like choose. And it's fascinating, but it makes more sense now that, you know, we hear it that way. Um, and so in terms of how one can deal with it, and we're speaking, by the way, about specific context of the United States, <laughs> how different it is. I mean, there are some things that obviously are um, culturally very different, but some themes that repeat across societies as well. And when we speak about the way that you have dealt with it through writing. And that's one theme that I wanted to ask you about in terms of expressing yourself. Um, there was one point in the book that you describe and, and one appointment with an acupuncturist as a sort of turning point. What was that suggestion and why that prescription made you realize, what did the prescription made you realize about your physical pain as well? Yeah, so I went to so many different specialists, and most of the time they are prescribing me medication that made everything worse. Mm -hmm. I was intolerant to a lot of it, and then the more research I did, I was like, oh, women are prescribed dosages meant for male bodies, so we get have um, we're prone to adverse drug reactions. Um, <laughs> So I went to try alternative medicine, Eastern medicine, went to acupuncture and the first thing, so she was, my acupuncturist like interviewed me beforehand, sort of like what a doctor does while doing an intake with you. But she asked questions that a doctor had never asked me. And one of them was, are you angry? And I went to her for a chronic headache I was having. I had a six month headache. And without thought, I just said, yes. And she was like, who is making you angry? And I just went down the list. And she was like, have you expressed this anger? And I laughed. I was like, no. Like as if it's an option to be angry and to express your anger and to tell people who you're mad at that you're mad at them. No, <laughs> that's just not how I was raised. Um, that is bitchy. So, um, I always just held it in, pushed it down, tried to turn it off, make it into something else, blame myself, turn it on myself. So she told me, she recommended that I confront the people who are making me angry by being angry at, at, at them. <laughs> um, and I was like, yeah, I'll do that when I get better. And I didn't, even consider that it would help me because this was six months into my two-year long illness so I didn't do it right away and I was really skeptical that it could help me um and then I I did it in tandem with other therapies I was treating I was seeking that had like a similar theme of a talking cure where I needed to express myself not only to advocate my advocate for myself with doctors and assert the authority of my own body and to use my voice to save my own life, to protect myself, which I wasn't used to doing. I was used to going into survival mode by being silent. Um, so when I started expressing myself and I started expressing my anger, I felt better. Like not immediately, it wasn't a cure-all. It was just like, I remember I wrote a really angry email to my dad <laughs> and my headache was relieved for like a few days. And the more and more and more I kept practicing saying what I was thinking, the better I was feeling. And that was in tandem with, again, other therapies mm -hmm. I was seeking and other treatment I was getting. Um, but the fact that it could help so much and relieve physical pain mm -hmm. was mind boggling to me. And then I read a lot about the mind body connection and how 
repression makes us physically ill. So many studies about people who live longer, who express their anger, who express their opinions, who say what's on their mind, who speak up for themselves. And then a few statistics, of course, about women who do say the word no, and they're murdered for it. Mm -hmm. It is dangerous to use our voice. People don't want us to do it, and they will take extreme measures. Like a lot of domestic terrorism begins as intimate terrorism, and there's such a thing as rejection violence. And a lot of the incels go on shooting sprees in high schools because they've been rejected sexually or romantically by women. Mm-hmm. And that kind of always leads us back to the theme of silence. Um, you write at one point in the book, the silences are everywhere. Many I experienced, but many I didn't notice. And I thought it was really fascinating how you describe silence both as a verb, as a noun, and how noun becomes a verb. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I remember feeling like a genius. I like self high five <laughs> when I was playing with that because I was like, <laughs> um, I was thinking that you know to silence someone that's a verb. Yeah. Um, when when people like turn off our voice for us, then silence becomes a noun because it becomes a place and a place to exist in. Mm and a place you can't get out of. Mm. And then once you're in that place, you start silencing yourself. Mm. And it becomes like an everyday action where you're living in silence, but you're contributing to that silence by self-silencing. And that's certainly what I did. I was so sick of everybody silencing me that I was like, I'll show you, I'll silence myself. I'll beat you to the punch. You don't have to do it. I just won't say anything because I don't want to face the retribution. I don't want to face the punishment. I don't want to deal with it. It's just so much easier to say nothing. And for a while that really worked. And it can be like, not, I don't want to say an effective coping mechanism, but it can be like um, a popular coping mechanism to just turn off, shut down. That's why so many streaming services are so popular in part. Um, But ultimately it really hurt me because it made me sick and it threatened my life. And that part of self-silencing, I mean, when you say that in part, even today, how it's like you, but then I can say we, you know, we kind of are scared to even say, like you say, to mention patriarchy for fear of being dubbed a feminazi um, as just one of the many fears that that we fear, many fears that we fear in the sense of that self-silencing theme as, as a nuance or, or like a follow-up to that silence uh, because it ends up hurting. And at one point, you say how when you were scared about dying, it was the thought that you were going to die with so much unsaid. I mean, that was so infuriating and sad at the same time. Yeah. One of the benefits of being sick is you get this clarity and you get this urgency and... I could have gone my whole life being quiet and not necessarily noticing the repercussions because I would be hiding them from myself. And then when I saw, like I felt unalive when I was silencing myself because it wasn't just that I wasn't saying what I was thinking and I was over apologizing. I wasn't living my life. I was afraid of conversation, you know, and everything on top of that. So I really just stopped being a person in my silence. And then when I saw that I could literally stop being a person, I was like, it was just, it flashed where I was like, I cannot live with the fact that I have kept so much to myself 
And it was really clear to me when someone I love dies, not to spoil the book. Um, and I literally had unsent drafts of text messages to this person that I didn't get to send. And I remember always thinking, I'll send it later, I'll send it later. Um, and then I never, ever sent it. And nothing is worth it. I was like, what was I waiting for? What was I so afraid of? This is worse than anything. Um, losing someone, losing yourself, ha losing your health, possibly losing your life. That I was just like, I would rather risk being uncomfortable and risk so much more than give up and to not say how I felt for not only to the people I loved, not only to express myself, not only to doctors and to boyfriends and to bosses, but like to baristas too. <laughs> I, I was just like, there's so much I'm not saying all the time. I'm afraid to ask for a straw. I'm afraid to say no to a man. Like it just, it was like in every interaction felt so debilitating and I had to contort myself or shut myself down or edit myself in all these micro ways that led to like this overall sense of just like unaliveness and not being a person. And I was like, but this is what society wants. They don't see me as a person. Like when the woman's body is not the human body, when women are killed off on every single television show all the time, when women aren't reporting the news as often as men, when women aren't running um, governments or businesses or TV, or, you know, all that stuff. Like, that's what I meant by those silences are everywhere. Like we are not hearing women's voices or their perspective. And thus we cannot see them as human and worthy of being alive. And we internalize that. And for so much of my life, because I was depressed, I wanted to die. But it was also because I was bombarded with content that was telling me I was better off dead. You know, like every television show I watched, there was a dead girl, a raped woman, an abducted teen. Um, nobody really cared. It seemed like what I had to say, unless I was like a tomboy or super hot um, or flattering them, stroking their ego, being a good girlfriend, doing it for love, like doing like 69 hot sex positions. Like I had no value otherwise. Um, so it was just really easy to imagine myself dead because that's what the world seems to want from us. Ugh. And then even when one decides to kind of try to get over it and start expressing oneself, we get to that language machine situation where in another stroke of genius, you kind of formulated that term. Uh, what does it tell us? Uh, why, what are the consequences for women's stories when they decide to share them with the world? Yeah, so when women do get the courage to speak up, um, a lot of our speaking is immediately edited, regurgitated, deleted. Um, so like something will go in the language machine, he raped her and come out the language machine, she was drunk and she is lying. Mm -hmm. So it, the language machine takes a lot of responsibility off of the people in power and privilege who control the language machine. And it puts the onus on marginalized communities and people who don't get a say, don't control the narrative, who are often dismissed in our culture. And it happens in everything we do and say. Um, so it happens in how we get our news. It happens in the popular stories we read, see on TV, the conversations we have with each other, what we see in court testimony, what we see playing out politically. It's just that everything gets turned around and twisted so that the people in power stay in power and the marginalized communities stay marginalized. And we do it with language. 
and how we talk about people, who gets to talk about people, and who is denied and demonized. Mm -hmm. And throughout the book, you do acknowledge um, both your own position, but also you say, for example, the language machine is binary. Woman means cis woman. The language machine is racist. Woman means white women, white woman. And feminist means white cis feminist. And patriarchy means patriarchy as experienced by middle class cis white feminists as well. So that language machine many times not only ensures, like you say, crime isn't illegal or so bad, it really helps us um, make norms sound different for different people um, because many often they get applied differently to different people in our society. Speaking of perspectives, though, um, or changing perspectives, uh, you write about Me Too movement as well, both in terms of how you received it or how you acted at the beginning, why you acted. Um, I mean, tell us how um, that perspective changed uh, when, when it came out. And in general, I thought it was powerful how you speak of your views on rape culture as a picture of an iceberg. Yeah, so when the Me Too movement came out, I was scared. I was scared at everything at that point. And I did not want to participate. I thought it was revolutionary what was happening that suddenly all of these women um and of course not just women so many different people were sharing what was previously unshareable and stigmatized and made a dirty secret and there was this huge community but i didn't know where i fit in that and i didn't know what I wanted to say of anything. And then nothing really changed. Like there have been a few retrospectives, like five years into Me Too, what has really changed? You know, not much. And a lot of people shared their stories and it did, it did change things. Some people were fired. We now have a different standard, I think, of harassment, like a different standard in our popular imagination. But of course it's become like a joke to many people because mm -hmm. it's like the woke mob is coming for me, for you. And you're going to be a victim of cancel culture if you try to hug someone. Um, so it's of course been used against us as all things are. Um, but I realized, you know, it took me a long time to realize why I didn't want to participate in Me Too. And it felt so uncomfortable to not say anything, but I was so used to not saying anything that I couldn't quite help it at that point. Um, but I realized I was like, I don't feel comfortable speaking my truth on a platform that is overrun by trolls, created and controlled by men who are making money off of testimony. And all of these people immediately receive backlash for speaking their mind. It doesn't feel like a safe place to speak your mind. And that's just not where I was going to learn how to speak up for myself. It wasn't, the internet was not a place for me, but for many other people it has been, and I salute them. That is cool. Um, so I had to find like an alternative means to tell my story. And for me, it's writing long chapters about it. Mm -hmm. And then it's also trying to, like, I don't want to say like make it academic, contextualize it, mm -hmm. just like put it into a narrative. Like I was trying to figure out what had happened to me, had what happened to me really happened to me, what happens to women. And then I was thinking about, I, about rape culture. You know, it was in every feminist mouth, that phrase, like Rebecca Solnit had written a lot about it. It made a lot of sense to me. And a lot of people at the same time didn't know what it was. And I found myself trying to explain it over and over to people. And then I got a really good metaphor. A friend showed me a pyramid mm -hmm. that um, was um, like an illustration of rape culture. And I really liked that. But I was thinking, well, it's really more like an iceberg because what we see in rape culture are the most obvious worst parts of it. 
at the very top, we see rape, murder, sexual violence against women. Um, but there are so many degrees and it goes all the way down to the very bottom that is pervasive, ubiquitous, again, in the water supply. And it's basic stuff like not believing women, not listening to women, transferring all emotional labor onto women, um, all the stuff that I was writing about in the book, these little micro sexisms, it's all connected and it all makes room for rape and murder in our culture. Yeah, and there's always that connection that you mentioned uh, a while ago. I mean, uh, the mind-body um, connection as well. And the studies that you've cited are just so brutal. And we, I mean, once you see it on the paper, like one from Rage Becomes Her from Soraya Chamali, um, that when women repress their anger, they're twice as likely to die from heart-related disease. And that is, I mean, that even certain cancers like breast cancer are particularly in black women have been linked to that extreme suppression of anger. That mind-body connection, even sometimes why we don't feel comfortable or why we need time to come forward and act is so important um, in terms of self-compassion towards ourselves too, I think, that we don't berate ourselves when we don't immediately have that courage to go forward. I tell myself often, <laughs> but your help, your book really helped me to think about it in uh, in more explicit ways, both from learning from your personal experiences and the studies. And throughout the book, we learn about misogyny in big tech, film, television, social media, and you describe workplaces, sex, dating, pop culture. So there's a very important theme of reckoning um, throughout the book. And in terms of at least, you know, how you ended up trying to face everything that was happening. Um, so I was curious to hear your thoughts about just what reckoning meant for you or what it could mean for each of us. For me, I just had to come to an awareness that everything I was consuming was contributing to my self-hatred and self-silencing and that I wasn't imagining it and that I wasn't crazy and it wasn't my fault. And I had no reason to hate myself. Like it was, it was because of the messages I had absorbed and was regurgitating. That was why I felt the way that I did and acted the way that I did. And like, it may like, we like talk about patriarchy like it's so obvious and sexism is so obvious, but I really don't think that it is. <laughs> I think that's why they work so well because they're so insidious and they hook their teeth into us in in ways where we're not even paying attention. Like I didn't even notice that all my favorite shows there was at least one woman who had one woman who had to get raped. It just like needed it for the storyline. Mm -hmm. I in writing it down and in going through everything I loved, <laughs> I I saw it and felt so betrayed by that. And I was like, I have to make so many different choices because I, like a lot of people, feel powerless when it comes to elections. You know, I vote, canvas, talk to people, protest. You know, those are things like we do to feel like active citizens. Um, but I needed to just make different choices for myself so that I could hate myself less and hate women less. Cause I hate a woman as much as the next person. Like I'll just be, you know, watching the Sopranos incredible show. And I'm like, ah, oh, kill that stripper. <laughs> like she's so mouthy. Like I just get, and I really feel like viscerally like annoyed mm -hmm. by these nagging women. Um, and you know, that's like on every single show where I'm like, she deserves it. She wanted it. I think what everyone else is thinking. Um, and I don't want to think like that anymore. And I will put on mascara before a self-defense class and I'm like oh my god patriarchy is everywhere it is like when I close my eyes 
it is in my thoughts. It is like, <laughs> like all over me. It just feels like bed bugs that won't ever go away. Um, so, so just that awareness that it's everywhere, but I don't have to consume. I don't have to give my attention to it. I can talk against it. I can write different stories. I can have different conversations. I can call people out around me. Uh, people aren't going to like it. And I'm just going to risk being unlikable and um, risk being annoying, risk being perceived as being annoying. Cause I'm like, saying my opinion isn't annoying. Like I'm not some person on social media throwing off 70 opinions about something I know nothing about. I'm giving like one opinion per day that's like researched mm -hmm. and still I feel mortified mm -hmm. and like I'm annoying someone. Um, so just trying to like undo that in my own brain mm -hmm. and to talk about it with people around me that's the kind of reckoning that feels possible. Mm -hmm. Which is a constant training, right? With the no, with the word no, and what no means and the power of that word in so many situations that um, we need to consciously think about. So as we approach the end of the conversation, I just want to hear from you. I'm curious about the reactions to this book. Um, were they as you expected? What did you expect? I'm, I'm truly just curious. I saw several interviews um, online, but how do you feel about it? And also just tell me the wider angle, Alisa, about this whole situation. <laughs> or everything I was gonna say atmosphere <laughs> over over encompassing space and air that that um that we live uh, that we breathe of just women's suppressed voices and the subjugation to silence and the pain that you have um shared from your personal experiences and then everything the research that you found for so many who share similar ones so the reaction I guess was maybe what I expected it to be I thought a lot of people would hate it um, I thought I would get a lot more hate mail than I've gotten that this is not me asking for it. Um, <laughs> so, so that's good. <laughs> Maybe because, uh, and I'm curious, sorry for interrupting that a lot of women, or I don't know, is it most women who might read the book who really might see themselves in so many reactions that you describe? Um, I would assume that Maybe that might be one of the reasons. I don't know. But so I I'm just curious about um, what, you know, in that aspect of reactions that you uh, expected or heard. <laughs> yeah. So people often at readings will be like, is it all men? And I'm like, hashtag not all men. Um, <laughs> I, like when I'm talking about this, like <laughs> we have such binary thinking in our culture where mm -hmm. everything is like men versus women and men or women are completely evil. Um, I'm just talking about how we live in a society that has been historically dominated by men in terms of who creates the laws, who creates the stories, who creates the technology, who's in control of so much. And this impacts every single person. And it's in a patriarchy, not every man is a perpetrator. Um, of course not. Like in many ways, they're victims. Like we're all victims in a social structure and a power structure that privileges a single point of view, a single narrow point of view. No one benefits from that except for the person who has that point of view. Um, and I just read this article last night in the New Yorker about like what's happening to all the men because they're mm -hmm. dropping out of the workforce at high numbers and their um, fewer men are staying in school and going to college. And there's a problem with men. Um, and that's not what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just talking about this pervasive sense that we listen to men and we don't listen to women. So it's not that I think 
men are bad, men are sexist, men are this. It's that men are authorities, men are experts, and women are not. And that kind of thinking is bad for all of us, is bad for all of us. And it's, you know, really bad, again, for the people who don't have that singular, that single perspective. Um, and you can raise your children to listen to women and to believe women. It starts in the home, but it, you know, it also starts in what they're watching on TV, who is making the laws. You know, we, of course, with overturning Roe v. Wade, that is taking women's voices away. That is saying we do not have control of our bodies, um, telling us what to do with our bodies, making our bodies prisons, making our bodies in service to anyone but ourselves. Like there is a backlash and a doubling down against women achieving any kind of equality with men. And that is what feminism is. It's equality for all people. It's not taking power away from men so that women can have power. Like that's a huge misconception and that's just not what's happening here. I don't wanna burn down all the men. I'm not saying kill all the men when I say burn down the patriarchy. It's like burn down these long held beliefs that privilege one group's perspective over everyone else's perspective. Mm -hmm. Did I answer and, the question? And that you're not, or that women are not hysterical, right? When they do voice their opinion and facts, so many that are here. Um, Elisa Bassis, thank you so much for joining New Lines Magazine's Wider Angle podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I love talking to you. This was so real. Um, and to everybody else, stay tuned for more conversations with people from all over the globe. Have a good day. Bye.